How many iPhones are there? What, 100 million? And you can go into the deepest, darkest jungles of Philippines, and there's going to be folks with iPhones. Okay. All right. <laughs> you see some homeless guy walking down 61 <laughs> South in Vicksburg, okay, pushing his, pushing his, bas his basket <laughs> with his iPhone. <laughs> You wrong, Dr. Moore. You wrong. It's the truth. Okay? It's wrong. It's the truth. All units. So here we go. Units. Uh, written by the paper, written by Cardigan and uh, I'm sorry, Richie and Ken Thompson. Dennis Richie and Ken Thompson. By the way, uh, Dennis Richie and Cardigan. Uh, anyway, Cardigan and Richie are the ones that invented the C programming language. And what did they invent C for? To build Unix. Okay? So that's why C is called a systems programming language. Okay? A systems programming yeah. language. It's the most prolific language. If you can only speak one language, it ought to be C. Flat out. And I'm not talking about C++ where you glue a bunch of OO crap on top of C. Okay? It's plain vanilla C. And by the way, even when you do see OOC, as soon as you get down three millimeters below the OO veneer, it's all going to be C anyway. You know, it's, it's a marketing strategy. Oh, yeah, it's written in C. It's modern. No, it's not. It's written in C. Good. So here we go. Uh, the abstract. Unix is a general purpose, multi-user, interactive operating system for the PDP-11. Okay? Number of features seldom found. Number one, hierarchical file system with demountable volumes. Number two, this is cool, compatible file device and interprocess I.O. Okay, they do everything as files. Makes the life so much simpler. Okay, and asynchronous processes, system command language. Okay, a selectable on a per user basis that has to do with which shell do you want to use? Bash, CSH. TCSH, K, KSH, yada, 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 yada. All right? And then 100 subsystems, including uh, languages. Good. So primarily, you're talking in this paper about the file system and the shell. All right? Primarily, the file system and the, share, the shell. I love this. My first, I about fell over when I read this. It says, Unix can run on hardware costing as little as $40,000. <laughs> you can replace that today with $150. Okay, go down to the, your local you know, computer store and get a year and a half old um, note, uh, netbook, you know, 150 bucks, toss Ubuntu Linux on it, bam. So the notebook, the net, the, the netbook costs you 150 bucks. How much does Ubuntu cost you? Yeah. Nothing. It's free. Okay. So, yeah. good. So, and they also say that less than two man years were spent on the main software system. Okay. Good. Yet it contains blah blah blah. All right. Good. A little bit about the, the hardware environment. Okay. So they did it on a, a PDP 11.45. Uh, my, my first assembly language programming course, I used a PDP 11, 1102, I think it was called. Okay, and this guy has 16 bit words, 144K of core, and notice that Unix only uses 42K of that. So Unix only uses 42K of the 144K. Okay, so moving on to the next page. All right, here we go. Their particular PDP-11 has a one megabyte fixed disk head, a fixed head disk, okay, four moving head disks, each of which has 2.5 megabytes. By the way, this is the old cartridges you stuck and shoved in. All right, and then a single moving head disk, which has 40 megabytes. These are the old disk pads, all right. And then he also points out that there's a high-speed paper tape reader punch. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen those. It's a piece of paper tape about probably an inch and a half wide with a bunch of holes in it. 
So we used to, you get to the PDP and you, you talk when the, if, if you left it turned off for a long enough period of time, even though magnetic core memory is, um, is a, a semi, what's the word when it doesn't erase when you turn power off? I'm losing my mind. Semi volatile. It's, it's not volatile, it's involatile. But there's another word for that, like ROM, non volatile. It's, okay, cores are more or less non-volatile memories, except after a long period of time, the cores lose their magnetism. Yes. Okay, they lose their, it, it bleeds, it kind of bleeds off, so to speak. All right, but over, over you know, days at least, perhaps weeks, the core memories retain their, their memory. But when they lose it, you have to take the bootstrap loader, so you'd sit at the front of the PDP-11, and there was a... There was a set of LEDs that corresponded to the program counter, and then there was a set of LEDs that corresponded to the word, which when you clicked, went into the program counter that was specified. So what you do is you'd reset the program counter to all zeros, and then with the bottom you'd toggle, and so this kind of cool stuff. So you got, well, they were actually probably not LEDs, and then there's a switch here. You just go, all right, and then below each light is a switch. So up, up was a one, down was a zero. And then down here you had another similar array like that. So 16 of them and then this switch out here. See, what you do is you take all these guys and you put them all down and you go ch -ch -ch. And what that would do is it would put all zeros in here. So what's the program counter now pointing to? Memory location zero. Then you come down here and off of your sheet of paper, you would toss in the 16 bits that corresponded to, so up, down, whatever they were, that corresponded to the first word of the bootstrap loader, and then you would go, and it would sophisticate it now. Not only would it load it into the specified program counter location, but it would increment the program counter for you. Right. Mm -hmm. High tech. So after you, then, so then all you did is you load up the next word, load up the next word, and it was about a 15 word, something like 15 word, what was called bootstrap loader, bootstrap loader, okay. And then once you did, so there was enough. That's why it's called today booting the computer. Mm -hmm. So you put in this 15 word bootstrap loader. And it was just smart enough to know how to read the paper tape, All right? Then you put the then you reset the program counter to location zero, and you'd hit the run button. And it was just there were just enough there was just enough smarts in the 15 word bootstrap loader to where it could read the paper tape. And what was loaded on the paper tape was the real loader. So you would put the bootstrap loader in here, then you'd load the real loader off the paper tape. Then with the real loader in there, then you can start loading off the paper tape, all of the other things, and eventually get smart enough to load it off of disk drives and stuff. So it was a, 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 fairly, a fairly arcane process. Where's the bootstrap loader contained in today's modern systems? In the uh, hard drive? Hard drive? Hard drive. No. Oh, that's not a RAM. No, close. ROM. It's the ROM. Okay, yeah. right? And so when they flash your computer, right, right. They're putting, they're updating the contents of the bootstrap loader and perhaps other things, all right? So good. So we move on now. Now that you've had your history lesson from Grandpa. <laughs> he went shiny in my day. <laughs> okay. OK, good. So moving on, nine track magnetic tape, OK? Typewriter, 14 variable speed comm interfaces. And a series of these data sets, um, a data set has to do with, it's not quite exactly the same as a modem in the sense that it didn't uh, modulate it up to voice frequency and down, but a data set would take the ones and zeros and translate them out to whatever device was out there now, for the data set. Did it also have those SAML layers that we studied about? Did it have a what? Those, the SAML layer structure that we studied about? Which, which structure? There, there's a SAML layer structure. But that's in communication. So I, I, I'm not sure what, what okay, structure so you're talking it, about. It can't be that. There's always seven layer. 
Oh, oh, the or seven the layer. Line. No, this was way. No, no, this is this is not network. Okay. This is just data lines going out to the printer. Okay. Today we use things like universal serial bus, USB. Yeah. Uh, earlier generation, you used parallel cables. Mm -hmm. Those aren't those aren't a network layer. Those are direct signals, ones and zeros going out over some protocol. Okay. No, it wasn't the, it wasn't the OSI seven layer. That was much 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 later. All right. So a picture phone interface, voice response unit, blah, 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 blah. And then they say the greater part of Unix is written in the aforementioned C. In the reference, of course, if you look out there, the reference number six is going to be Richie Conference, uh, Richie DM C reference manual. And notice that it's an unpublished memorandum. Bell Laboratories, 1973. Okay. This is like cool stuff. It's like really historical to me. Okay, so moving on then. Good. Uh, they talked about some of the things that they did included multi-programming and what's called re-entrant code. So sometimes if two users needed the same piece of code, Okay, under the old way, you both have to load your copy of that code up to be able to get to it. Reentrant code allows me to be running the code, and then at the same time, you come in and run the same code, and obviously we're going to be at different locations within the code. But reentrant code, multiple users can run it at the same time. By the way, reentrant code is a necessity for like p thread layers. So if you don't have, if you don't have code that's considered thread safe, all right, then that means it's not re-entrant and you get into trouble. It's doing stuff like keeping state where it's not supposed to keep state and then when the other guy comes in and tries to run the code, it tromples on the other guy's stuff. All right, so re-entrant code, okay. Then, here we go. The most important role of Unix, this is page 366, the most important role of Unix is to provide a file system, all right, good. Now, here's where Unix, is, they, they, they did it the right way. Turns out there's three kinds of files. They're what are called ordinary files. What they call directories. And what they call, quote, special files. All right. Uh, these are I.O. devices. Now, how cool is this? So they take and group everything that you do under one file system. And since it's one file system, you've got one protection mechanism. Okay, everything, everything. Okay, this was really, really progressive thinking on their part. Come up with this idea. All right, good. So ordinary file, that's just what we think of it when we talk about a file, right? You know, I've got my, my executable, my bin, my binary executable, I've got my data, I've got my Excel spreadsheet, all of those. So an ordinary file is just your regular file. Now unlike later operating systems like DOS and all these where the extension meant something, in true Unix the extension, is, it doesn't matter. The extension's irrelevant. It's just a bunch of ones and zeros, an ordinary file. Now, an application may know what to do based upon an extension, but it, it's not an intrinsic capability of Unix. Unix could care less. Unix could care less. It's just a bunch of ones and zeros, okay, stored out on a disk. That's it. All right? And notice they say no particular structuring is expected by the system. It could be a string of characters, it could be a string of bytes, it does not matter. Now, he does point out in the last sentence of 3.1, the structure of files is controlled by the programs which use them, not by the system. Unix could care less. Okay, the next thing he talks about is the directories. Let me just make a comment here um, so that it's all clear. Well, a few comments. Let me, in church, the pastor would call this chasing a rabbit. Okay, I'm going to chase a rabbit for a minute. If you 
were to think of a traditional hard drive, you would have a series of planners, right? So each of these are distinct pet platters on some kind of a spindle, right? On some kind of a spindle. And this entire thing is rotating, right? And then, in between each set of platters, I'm going to symbolically show it like this. Okay? This is a little tiny gigantic coil. This is a little tiny coil. All right? So let me ask you this. If I take a magnet near a coil and I go with the magnet, what's going to happen to the coil? It's going to turn, right? It induces a magnetic field. Well, no, the magnetic field is Electrical. when I move the magnet. Electrical. Yes, it induces, an, it induces an electrical current into the coil. Okay? So what is this, what is this surface doing here? Spinning. It's rotating, mm -hmm. and on it, it has a special coating that corresponds to little tiny, a billion little magnets. They can either be oriented one way, or they can be oriented the other way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you think, micro, if I were to look you know, down in the weeds and say, this little section right here, what I would see in there are a bunch of little magnets. You know, north, south. You know, north, south, like that. A bunch of little magnets, okay? Mm -hmm. And this, so this surface is broken up into what are called tracks. Think of them as concentric circles. Mm -hmm. And then think of pizza slices. And those are called sectors. So on a hard drive, the way you, and I'll use the term address, the way you address a specific chunk of data, okay, let me get my crayon here, my right crayon, say that it's the chunk of data that lives in that little piece. Notice that it's on a particular track and it's on a particular sector. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, and now, do you notice underneath there would be another sort of identical one, and then another one down here, and then another one down here, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're stacked up, okay? All right, so, good. If I take one of these tracks, and I kind of look down through all of the platters, that is called a cylinder. Right? Mm -hmm. So what you talk about when you're addressing on a disk drive, a multi-platter disk drive, is a cylinder. You go to a certain cylinder, right, mm -hmm. and then you rotate to a certain sector within that cylinder and read the data off. So I've got these heads going into each platter. Do you see this? So in this silly example, I've got one, two, three, four heads, four set, but so really eight, eight heads because top and bottom. So I've got eight heads, and they're simultaneously reading eight sectors and eight tracks. Mm -hmm. Do you see it? Good. Now, independently of this physical arrangement, you can think of a hard drive as being this. All right, you can think of it as being a linear array of storage. All right, the addressing mechanism, the fact that it's circular and all that, it still boils down to tracks and sectors. Track zero, sector zero. Right? Track zero, sector one. Track zero, sector two. Track zero, sector three. Track zero, sector n. Then track one, sector zero. Right? So ultimately, it's still just a sequential stream of, this is track zero, sector zero, and this is track, track N, sector M. All right, it's still just a sequence of ones and zeros, isn't it? Is there an inherent hierarchy to that? No, 
right? But yet when we see and when we look at, say, Unix, what do we see? The illusion that we see is you get the root, right? And then what's under root? Under root you see, well, among other things, you've got user, bin, Etsy, home, uh, opt, oftentimes, temp, like this, and it goes, right? And then under each of those, for example, under home, you might have, you know, you might have Maurice, you might have Morris, you might have Ashley, and so on and so forth, right? And then under Maurice's, he might have his own set of directories, right? And then ultimately, maybe some actual file, all right? Some actual file, all right? This is not what you get on a hard drive, okay? That's not what you get on a hard drive. Hard, hard drive is a sequence of ones and zeros, okay? The mechanism which creates this illusion, okay, is the directory structure. Okay, it's the directory structure. Turns out that what you do with a hard drive is you break it up into what are called inodes. Okay, and we'll get into all the details later. So, good. So directories provide the mapping between the names of files and the files themselves. This is page 366, 3.2. Okay, and therefore induces a structure on the file system as a whole. So this is, even though this is a linear array of ones and zeros, okay, the thing called the directory structure causes it to look like this. And we'll see how that all happens. But let me just give you a hint, okay? All right? Um, so looking at home, what is home actually? in this picture here. What is it? It's a directory, isn't it? Right? But there's no such thing as a directory. But watch. What if I had a file that looked like this? Okay, what if I had a file that, that looked like this? And this is the file, and I'm going to call it home. All right? I'm going to call it not the file. It's not a regular file. It's a directory file. But it's a file nonetheless. And, it, and it's going to have in it three entries. Okay, and the well, it's really got five because home has itself, which is dot, and it has its mommy, which is dot dot. So there's me, my mommy, and then Maurice, Morris. And Ashley. Now, question: What does Maurice reference? Does it reference a real file, or does it reference another directory? A directory. It, could be it references directory. another directory, but it's still down in the weeds a file. It's a file. Okay. And so, what we have over here is is an inode number. Okay, and what we're going to do later is we're going to partition this thing up into a bunch of inodes. All right? That so, is, is, are you saying so that's the way it's mapped into that? That's the way it's mapped. The directory structure mm -hmm. is the mapping mm -hmm. that causes this to be able to be understood. Okay. So you can understand what's going on. That's is that the same as compartment? Is, though, right, what's that? That's just like what you're saying. That's what partitioning is when you... Yes, it's setting up the number of inodes, okay, and et cetera, et cetera, okay, so. Dr. Morris, is that the same as, what, as the paper was talking about compartments and? Uh, in the other paper, yeah, uh, similar, not okay. quite, but similar. So here we go. So directories provide a mapping. Then each user has a directory of his own files, mm -hmm. and he may also create subdirectories to contain, contain groups of files conveniently treated together. Mm -hmm. All right, good. So then, going on, it says, the system, by the way, let's reiterate that each of these directories and each of these files has a set of permissions associated with it. And remember in Unix, it was 
user, group, others, and the three forms of permission were read, write, execute. Right. So user, group, other, and then read, read write, execute. execute. That's the protection mechanism that's placed on each of these. All right. So it goes on to say then, at the top right of 366, each user has a directory of his own files and creates subdirectories. And moving on down, the system also has directories, okay? And it says that all files in the system can be found by tracing a file through the chain of directories until the files are reached. So conceptually, please follow me on this one, all right? Please follow me on this one. Let's say that I know what I know contains the root directory. So that's a fixed known location on the hard drive. So, all right, but what, what is the root directory actually? It's just a file, it's a file, right? So suppose that I structure it so that this inode right here, okay, and let's call it inode zero. Okay, let's suppose that inode zero is the inode that contains the root directory. All right, now what is, so what's contained in the inode? The, the directory. Something like this. Something like this. Right. All right, so for root, so for root, that directory file would look something like this. And this is the, so the root is the only directory that has itself as a parent. Right. Okay? So, good. So, what I know does root have? Root? It has users. Zero. Oh. Oh, so it's going to be, okay. And where, what, what is the root's mommy? Root. root. Also root. zero. Right. All That's right? telling us location. The, the, the I node mm -hmm. zero, let's say, is hard coded to be root. Yes. Okay? So, because you have to know where to start somewhere. 